rise for our confession and absolution. <coughs> In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made Amen. heaven and earth. I said I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Almighty God, Maker and Redeemer, we poor sinners confess. Sorry. Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a poor, miserable sinner, confess unto you all my sins and iniquities with which I have ever offended you and justly deserved your temporal and eternal punishment. But I am heartily sorry for them, and I sincerely repent of them. And I pray you of your boundless mercy, and for the sake of the holy, innocent, bitter sufferings and death of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to me, a poor, sinful me. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Is this thing on? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> our psalm today is from Psalm 91. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High, I will say to the Lord, My refuge and my fortress, My God in whom I trust, For he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler, And from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his pinions, And under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and a buckler. You will not fear the terror of the night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in darkness, nor the destruction that wastes at midday. A thousand may fall at your side, but the ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will only look with your eyes and see your recompense of the wicked. Because you have made the Lord your dwelling place, the Most High, who is my refuge, no evil shall be allowed to befall you, nor plague come near your tent. For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. On their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against the sun. You will tread on the lion and the adder. Glory be to the Father and to the Son. Through the wilderness and brought them to the promised land. 
Guide the people of your church that following our Savior, we may walk through the wilderness of this world towards the glory of the world to come. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Spirit, one God, now and forever. Jesus answered him, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone. And the devil took him up and showed him all the kings of the world in a moment of time, and said to him, To you I will give all this authority and their glory, for it has been delivered to me, and I will give it to whom I will. If you then will worship me, it will all be yours. Jesus answered him, It is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only you shall serve. And he took him into Jerusalem and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here. For it is written, You will command his angels concerning you and to guard you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. 
And Jesus answered him, It is said, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. And when the devil had ended every temptation, he departed from him until an opportune time. This is the Gospel of the Lord. And now please join with me as we confess our common faith in the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible. And in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary, and was made man, and was crucified for us also under conscious life. He suffered and was buried. On the third day he rose again, according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. You may be seated, we will continue on to our sermon hymn. Which is only going to be up here. I'll play it all the way through once so you get how it goes. But 
There you go. But then again, his daddy does always, and I mean always, wear mismatched socks, so maybe he gets his odd fashion sense naturally. But at the risk of not of looking like I don't dress my children properly, I let Kai wear his shirts backwards. Thankfully, it was a really short-lived phase, and now he wears them like a normal person. Now that's a silly example. On a somewhat more serious note, I don't give in to Kai when he wants to eat candy for breakfast, even though he really, really, really wants to eat candy for breakfast. But then there's more life-impacting examples. I mean, take what happened to Saul on the road to Damascus. Saul was on the way to kill and imprison Christians, and then he met God, and he immediately surrendered to him. But what Paul did only makes sense. After all, who wouldn't surrender to God when you know for certain it is God that is commanding you to surrender? Well, actually, I can think of at least one person that didn't surrender to God, knowing that it was God. And the part that we read from Luke's Gospel this morning shows us this. But at the same time, it also shows us someone that didn't surrender even in the face of the greatest temptation. And the actions of that person show us when never surrendering, is, it also seems as if the devil didn't surrender either. The devil kept coming at Jesus with everything that he had, despite never winning even the most minor of victories. Our account starts off with Jesus already having fasted for 40 days. Needless to say, Jesus must have been starving at that point. Indeed, he was literally starving. The research that I did showed that people can live about 40 days without eating, but after that they must eat or face death by starvation. And I think that's important for us to realize because it seems like Jesus made it through this temptation without supernatural aid. He was as weak as any human being would be after not eating for so long, but I don't think that God was miraculously sustaining him. If that were the case, it would make his temptation, well, less wonderful than it truly was, and it would make Jesus' humanity much not like our humanity. And that's a critical thing for us to think about, because there's another way to think about the temptation. Now, what I'm going to say next is a controversial idea. So think of it more as one possible way to think about the temptation instead of a dividing line between faith and heresy. Consider this question. Was it possible for Jesus to give in to the devil's temptation? Was it possible for Jesus to give in? Well, some people believe that because Jesus was God, and God cannot sin, that means that Jesus could never have given in to the devil's temptation and sin. In other words, some people say that Jesus was impeccable. That is, it was impossible for Jesus to sin. However, while it's absolutely certain that Jesus never sinned, it seems like it could have at least been possible that had Jesus so chosen, he could have given in to the devil's temptation. Yes, Jesus is God, and God cannot sin. But while Jesus was fully God, while Jesus is fully God, he is also fully human, and humans can sin. Jesus was unique, both in terms of the Trinity and in terms of being human. He was fully human. For example, God cannot get hungry, and yet Jesus in this very account did get hungry. And take what it says in Hebrews 4.15. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. That makes it sound like if what Jesus was tempted and didn't sin was an extraordinary thing, which would not seem to be if it was impossible for Jesus to sin. If Jesus was like us when it comes to temptation, then it seems like there had to have been at least a possibility of him sin. And there's another aspect of the temptation we can consider. That is, Jesus was led to go to the wilderness and be tempted by the devil by the Holy Spirit, who had come upon him during his baptism. In, in addition to giving us a glimpse of the rather inscrutable nature of the Trinity, this shows us that Jesus wasn't doing this solely by his own volition. He was being led by the other members of the Trinity. 
And there's yet one more thing to think about here. And that is, was the devil truly present during Jesus' temptation? Maybe, but maybe not. It could have been that instead of the devil being there more or less physically, the devil was just putting these temptations into Jesus' head. Maybe, like when Jesus was up at the pinnacle of the temple, maybe Jesus wasn't physically there, but the devil was merely giving Jesus a vision that he was there. But nonetheless, in all the artwork I'm going to show you after this one picture, the devil is pictured there, but that's more of artistic license. And one final thing to think about, about the temptation, is that it is singular out of all the other accounts in the gospel because the disciples weren't there. If Jesus wanted people to know about this, he would have had to have told them. So, the first temptation. The devil says, if you are the Son of God, command this stone to be bread. Now, there are two parts to this temptation. In the first part, the devil said, if you are the Son of God. But it doesn't look like the devil was trying to get Jesus to doubt that. Jesus knew who he was, and he knew what he came to do. Indeed, as mentioned previously, Jesus had just gone through his baptism, at which point God the Father spoke from heaven, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. And also, Jesus repeatedly told his followers that he was going to die and be resurrected. So I don't think Jesus was ever tempted to think otherwise. And likewise, the devil himself knew who Jesus was. The demons knew it too, because there was a time a demon said of Jesus, You are the Holy One of God. <clears throat> but then there's the second part of what Je of the devil said. Command this stone to be bread. Now that would have been a great temptation because Jesus was literally on the edge of starving to death. And, and interestingly, the exact act the devil was trying to get Jesus to do was not a sin in itself. Turning stone to bread, while a miracle, was not in any way wrong. And Jesus would go on to perform other food-related miracles, like he turned water into wine, and he fed the 5,000, and then the 4,000. And indeed, we can even see say that Jesus creating bread in this manner was borderline necessity because he needed to eat so very badly. And the problem wasn't even that Jesus performing this miracle would make him the recipient, as though doing so would be selfish. Because there was another time that Jesus performed a miracle of which he was personally blessed. He once caused a coin to appear in a fish's mouth so that Jesus himself could pay the temple tax. The temple tax. Now, in his answer, Jesus identifies the problem. He said, it is written, man should not live by bread alone. So we can see that Jesus responds with scripture. That much is obvious. But, more importantly, Jesus responds with appropriate scripture. Jesus' quote comes from Deuteronomy 8.3. It is a part of Moses' teaching to the people when they were at the border of the Promised Land for the second time after having wandered around the desert for 40 years. In the part that Jesus quoted, Moses was reminding the people of God that God had tested them by letting them go hungry before he miraculously fed them with manna. So Moses' point was that the people that he was talking to should have been relying on God more than food, which again would have been especially clear to those people because every morning God was providing them with food. So Jesus was saying that all believers must put God first in all things. While our physical needs are important, they pale in comparison to our spiritual needs and our need to obey God in everything, even when doing that might make life harder for us, or even when we don't understand why God is commanding us. The problem with what the devil was suggesting was that Jesus ending his fast at that precise time was not the Holy Spirit or the Father's plan. Jesus had to wait until one of them told them it was the proper time to eat. Like Jesus once said, I do nothing on my own authority, but speak just as the Father has taught me. Well, right after that, the devil hits Jesus with the next temptation. Worship me, and I will give you authority and glory over the whole world. 
Now, unlike the previous temptation, this one was definitely a sin. Now, as to whether or not the devil actually had the right to give Jesus this offer is pretty confusing. In one sense, the devil did have authority because like Paul once said of the devil, he is the god of this world. And Jesus even referred to the devil as the ruler of this world. But on the other hand, like Martin Luther once said, the devil is God's name. What that means is the devil can do nothing, absolutely nothing, without God's permission. God might allow the devil or demons to tempt us, but if he does so, it is for God's own glory that God does so. And once again, Jesus responds with appropriate scripture. It is written, you shall worship the Lord your God, and him only you shall serve. Now, that quote comes from Deuteronomy 6.13. And though it would take time, Jesus himself would, have seen, would receive this type of worship and be served by people in that manner, because one day Jesus is going to be recognized as Lord of all by all. But it was going to be done at a time and a place and method of the Father's choosing, which could only happen after Jesus was died and resurrected. Now, Jesus had no doubts about that. Avoiding all of that pain would have been easier, but it wasn't the Father's way. The devil's way was easier. No physical pain of crucifixion. No emotional pain of being abandoned. No spiritual pain of becoming sin. But sometimes suffering is God's choice for his followers. And no one that loves God would avoid God's plan for their lives even if it is more painful. Well, right after that, Satan hits the Jesus with the next temptation. He takes him up to the top of the, of the temple and says, Throw yourself down from here, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you to guard you. Now, here we have something of a turnaround. The devil uses scripture just like Jesus. Well, not just like Jesus. Like I have been saying, Jesus always used appropriate scripture. The devil doesn't do that. He uses God's way in a different way, which shows us once again that the devil is pretty wily, which, by the way, has no relation to my last name. <laughs> Instead, it means that the devil is going to usually mix some truth in with his lies. The devil was right in that God will send his angels to guard his children, but not right in the way the devil suggested the scripture that the devil used comes from Psalm 91, which we actually read this morning, which rightly states over and over again in many ways that God will protect his followers. But the devil left out a few words. The true scripture goes like this. He will command his angels concerning you to guard you, but in your ways. The devil left out the words in your ways. Will God protect us? Absolutely. But we are only promised that, that if we are in God doing works for him. God did not give all people an unconditional promise of safety. The promise only applies to his people when they live for him. Well, Jesus, like usual, responds with appropriate scripture. He said, you shall not put the Lord your God to the text. That one comes from Deuteronomy 6.16. It was originally something Moses said to the Israelites when they accused Moses of trying to kill them with thirst. Well, after God provided water to the people, Moses re reminds them to stop doubting God. However, when we read this one, we need to be careful uh, to understand what Jesus was not saying. Jesus was not saying that it is wrong that it is not wrong to trust God to fulfill his promises, or even referring to those promises in prayer was wrong. When the, an example is when the people that Moses was, loading, was leading built and worshipped a golden idol, God told Moses he was going to destroy all of them. Well, Moses prayed to God for mercy. And in that prayer, Moses asked God to remember the promises that he had given to Abraham, Isaac, and Israel. That is, that he would multiply them and he would give them the promised land. Well, God listened and he didn't kill those people. 
We can and should trust God's promises and refer to them in prayer and even in our daily lives. So we can see one thing. Jesus was 100% successful in resisting the devil's temptations. But what about us? Well, just like Jesus did, let's turn to some appropriate scripture. 1 Corinthians 10, 13 to be exact. There it says, no temptation is overtaking you that is not common to man. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability, but with the temptation, he will provide a way of escape that you may be able to endure it. However, just like Jesus, we need to be sure to understand what is being said here. Paul was not giving us an unconditional promise that we will never be tempted beyond our ability, but that we will not be tempted beyond our ability if we rely on God and use God's method of escape. Now, the method of escape is going to vary. Sometimes it will be completely avoiding temptation. Other times it will be prayer. Or maybe it will be finding strength with our brothers and sisters in the faith. But no matter what, it will always involve the Word of God because that is our one and only source of the promises of God. And I think it can also help us to try to find out with what the devil might tempt us. 1 John 2.16 says, For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and the pride of life is not from the Father but from the world. When we have a desire and we wonder, is this a temptation compared to this verse? And I think we can figure that out. Are we being tempted, or are we being tempted to satisfy the desires of our flesh? That is, do we want to indulge in bodily desires like physical hunger or sexual drive or whatever? Now, note that those hungers are not wrong in and of themselves. God may grant them to us, but it will be at a time and place and method of his choosing. Yes, we can eat to uh, sustain our bodies, and we can even eat for pleasure, but we can't be gluttons. We can enjoy sex, but only in marriage. Jesus could only eat bread when the Father directed him to do it. Or... Are we, being attempt, are we being attempted by the desires of our eyes? That is, do we want things that God has not given us? More money, more stuff, a wrong relationship. The Bible tends to call things like that coveting. It is not always wrong to have those things, but it might not be God's plan in our lives for us to have them. God might have a God, Jesus rightly wanted all the kingdoms of the world to give him authority and glory. But that could only happen after his death and resurrection. Or maybe we're being tempted by the pride of life. That is, do we want to get what we want, but without suffering? There are always shortcuts in lives. But God's plan for our lives might have us to be work really hard and yet still deny those things to us now so that we can have our reward later. Jesus did not avoid God, avoid pain by calling on the Father to save him. Instead, he went to the cross and sacrificed himself for us. Now, one thing we have to keep in mind as we consider temptation is that temptation is not a sin. Giving in to temptation is a sin. Or like Martin Luther once said, you can't help if birds fly over your head, but you can prevent them from making a nest in your hair. Yeah, I mean, Martin Luther's a clever guy, but there you go. You know, we are like Jesus in temptation. We even have the very same Holy Spirit guiding us. Jesus knows what it is like to be tempted. Like it says in Hebrews 2.18, for because he himself suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. And so, my beloved, I leave you with this. We can resist temptation if we rely on Jesus. Now, may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen. All right, you may stand for our offertory.
wand towards the middle. Oh my, I only have one of these today. Woohoo, there we go, all right. <laughs> Father God, we bring all these prayers before you. We thank you so much for the privilege of bringing our cares and concerns and praises to you. Lord God, we pray that when temptation comes to us, that we are able to overcome it by relying on you. Help us to know that in you is perfect safety from temptation. Lord, your mercy, hear our prayer. Father God, we pray for the doers of your word out there, the people that are carrying your word to others, the people that are working quietly and silently that we don't know of. Please protect them from the world and the devil and help them to do the mission that you have given them. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father God, we bring up all households to you, but especially the households with children. Give the parents the ability to teach them about you and to bring you up in daily conversation. We pray for those children that the temptations they face may have no effect on them at all and they stay walking with you now and forevermore. Lord, your mercy, hear our prayer. And Lord God, we bring our government up to you. We pray that the leaders in government make decisions that honor you and we pray for bravery for them to stand against forces that would have them do otherwise. And Lord God, we ask for forgiveness for the times where our government has not done your will. Lord, your mercy, hear our prayer. And Lord God, we pray for all those who are sick or in pain, be it emotional or mental. We pray them that you relieve them of that, but if not, Jesus, you give them the peace to make it through this. And we pray that you lead us to help those people that are in our lives that are going through suffering. Lord, your mercy, hear our prayer. And Lord God, we once again bring up the people in Ukraine to you. We pray that this war comes to a swift end and any plans of evil that are against them come to nothing. We pray for bravery for all the governments of the world to stand strong in this thing. Ugh, Jesus, we also pray for to help us with our anxious thoughts during these times. Lord, your mercy, hear our prayer. And we bring up Steve Suri to you, Father God. He is sick. We pray for a miracle recovery, if that is your will. But if not, wisdom for the doctors and rest for him and his family. Lord, your mercy, hear our prayer. And Jesus, we continue to lift Pam up to you as she goes through treatments. Please give her strength and make it through these treatments. Please help the doctors to know exactly what to do at all times. And give her and all those that love her peace about this. Lord, your mercy, hear our prayer. Uh, we pray all these things through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We continue on now to the service of the sacrament. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give 
give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly being right and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who overcame the assaults of the devil and gave his life as a ransom for many, that with cleansed hearts we might prepare joyfully to celebrate this paschal feast in sincerity and truth. Therefore, with angels and archangels, with all the company of heaven, be laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and singing. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night that he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is in the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Welcome to the table of the Lord. Take and eat, the true body, the Lord, the of Jesus Christ. Take and eat, the true body, the blood of our Lord, the Savior, Jesus Christ, shed for you. Take and eat, the true body, the Lord, the Savior, Jesus Christ, shed for you. Take and drink, the blood of our Lord, the Savior, Jesus Christ, shed for you. Take and drink, the blood of our Lord, the Savior, Jesus Christ. Thank you. 
with you. Bless we the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Thank you. 